The LP Innovations Radio Network presents True Crime, the podcast series that explores real stories of employee theft. Employee theft costs companies billions in losses each year, and these dishonest behaviors can create collateral issues both inside and outside of the business. True Crime examines actual retail theft cases to demonstrate the techniques dishonest employees use, the opportunities they exploit, and as an example, the signs of dishonest behavior. The names and locations have been changed to protect the participants' identities, but all the cases are true crime. Today's episode we call A Pattern of Policy. I have a fascination with words, the manner in which they can provide several ways to convey similar meaning, but with subtle differences. For example, a lie can be a lie, or a fib, or a half-truth. And the word, or word phrase we choose, often describes our feelings on the topic. In loss prevention, one of my favorite phrases is cash shortage. Shortage is such a non-accusatory term, and sometimes it's a nice way to avoid contemplation of the starker truth, that the missing money is the result of theft. When the general manager in Wellesley called, it was to tell me about a series of these cash shortages on her front end. The new year had just begun, but at that moment, I already regretted not being on vacation. Cash issues are notoriously difficult to resolve. It's mostly due to the psychology behind the act. A dishonest employee can find a number of ways to rationalize the theft of merchandise. Things like, there's so much of it, or it has little value, or by claiming we throw away more than they took. Cash is different. It feels more like theft. It's hard to rationalize that it has no value, and consequently, it's harder for them to admit their actions. As the GM relayed her concerns, I nodded from my end of the phone. It was a familiar story. New cashier starts work, mysterious shortages begin. Sometimes it's a training issue, sometimes it's a dishonest cashier, and sometimes it's someone else setting up the new cashier to take the fall. The general manager didn't think it was anything more than a training issue. I've counseled her a couple of times, she informed me, and after things always improved. She really is a nice kid. So what's different this time, I asked. Well, she started and then paused. I gave her a minute to come around to it. I don't think she's stealing, but, well, it's getting to be a lot of money. I'm sure it's fine, I offered, not committing to any conclusion. When did it start, I asked. About four months ago. I know, I should have called you sooner, but it's fine, I repeated. And how much in total has the store lost? Including this time, about $550. I wasn't surprised by the amount. Dishonest employees sometimes struggle to rationalize cash theft, but honest people always struggle to believe nice kids steal. Consequently, these things often go on longer than they should. I arrived at the store and traded the warmth of my car for the parking lot's frigid January air. There wouldn't be any weather records broken that year, but the cold is like stealing. At a certain point, the depth and degrees become irrelevant. The store was warm and inviting. It reminded me that I enjoyed my job. I had never grown so jaded or cynical by the work that I thought in absolutes. Good people sometimes did bad things, and bad people sometimes did good things. It wasn't my job to judge, just to resolve. I met with Barb, and she had done an excellent job collecting investigative information. I reviewed the schedules, the till counts and audits, and Barb walked me through her attempts at corrective action with the employee. Lisa, as she explained, was 18 and other than the cash losses, an otherwise excellent employee. I was cynical enough to think, yeah, excellent, except for all the stealing. According to Barb, the problem began in October, just after Lisa completed her training. During her first month on the register, they had locked $270 in shortage. Barb had the foresight to isolate Lisa and to retrain her. The shortages had stopped until the end of November, when another occurred in the amount of $75. Did you speak with her after that? I asked. No, Barb answered. It was really busy with the holidays, and I assumed it was a mistake. Of course. In December, Lisa's total losses ran up to $150. I gave her a corrective action for that, Barb told me, and things were okay again. But? Well, last week, she had another $50 shortage. I looked at Barb's cash loss tracking sheet. Lisa was either terrible at counting money, or she had been stealing from almost day one. And how did Lisa react to the write-ups, I asked. Like I told you, Barb said, she's a good kid. She took it well. Oh, and one other thing she added, Lisa has a lot of financial problems. I didn't say it to Barb, but from what I could see on that sheet, it looked like Lisa had found a remedy for her money issues. Hi, this is Ray Esposito from LP Innovations. You know, seasonal stores are a great way for retailers to add additional revenue to the fourth quarter, to test out new markets, and to expand their brand recognition. But there can be a downside. Asset protection issues can easily wipe out any gains, and these kind of problems are notoriously difficult to resolve. 
At LP Innovations, we've been assisting companies with their seasonal stores for over 15 years. Our programs are built to fit the speed and style of the seasonal business. We've refined every aspect of our seasonal service to work effortlessly with these temporary locations. We help companies build effective short-form policies, execute practices to safeguard cash and merchandise assets, and quickly develop short-form audit and store security visits for better compliance. Most importantly, our national coverage lets us put our well-trained and experienced boots on the ground, even in your most remote seasonal locations. Our expert LP managers, investigators, and auditors can help resolve loss issues, conduct audits, analyze POS data, and provide an unprecedented level of store visibility. The best part is our seasonal programs not only have proven results, but are also affordable and cost-effective. We can have your program up and running in a few weeks, and there's no long-term contract or commitment. And because you pay by the month and by the store, you know the exact cost of your loss prevention investment. In today's economic environment, there's little room for unprofitable operations. So take the first step in protecting your seasonal investment and consider the LP Innovation Seasonal Store LP program. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.lpinnovations.com, contact a solutions expert at 877-574-6682, or send us an email at solutions at lpinnovations.com. An interviewer faces two types of dishonest employees. The hard target knows that you know what they've done. They know that they've been caught, but they aren't going to make it easy for you. They often get angry at you for their actions. It's the interview we're most prepared for. It's the behavior the interviewer expects. The soft target is a different species and in a way, much more confusing. They also know you know, but they admit so quickly, the interviewer looks around the room wondering if they've walked into an episode of Candid Camera. The admission comes so easy, you almost feel the need to ask, hey, did you understand what you just agreed to? Lisa was of the soft target variety. We didn't start the conversation, however, with the cash. We started with merchandise pass-offs. It was just a hunch on my part. A young clerk who steals money usually has even less compunction over merchandise. Lisa admitted to giving away about $400 in product to her friends. I heard Barb give an audible gasp when she heard the admission. The cash theft wasn't hard to get either. She admitted to every dollar with little prompting. What was important to Lisa was the opportunity to explain why she didn't think what she was doing was wrong. I nodded my head in a please do tell motion, and she continued. I thought, she began in earnest, that there was a certain amount that was okay to take. Interesting, I said, and how did you come to that particular conclusion? Well, the first couple times, no one said anything. I just went through some retraining. I could see Barb getting ready to jump out of her chair at that last remark. Yes, I said. They assumed you had just made a mistake. Well, when I took $75, though, I got written up, so I stopped for a while. And then? Well, and then I just took 50 in December. Yes, three times, I corrected. Yes, but it wasn't until I got to $150 that I got another write-up, so this month I only took 50. I figured that must be the amount that was okay. Barb's expression had gone from outrage to disbelief. There was complete sincerity in this young cashier's tone. Lisa really did think there was an acceptable pattern of theft within the policy. I don't say it often, but in a way you couldn't help but feel a little bad for Lisa. Yes, yeah, she was a thief, but there was an absence of malice in her actions and a level of naivety to her behavior. I believe that she really believed she was following a set of hidden rules. She was actually trying to work within the company's tolerance for loss. And there was a bit of truth in her observation. After all, most companies do have a tolerance to a certain amount of cash loss, although it's a tolerance for mistakes, not theft. But you could see where some people might get the wrong idea. In this case, restitution seemed the best course. Lisa agreed to pay back what she had stolen, and I wasn't really surprised when she asked the manager if she could get a few more hours each week to assist with the payback. Somebody had not prepared Lisa for the reality of the world. And it turned out Lisa was far more surprised at being terminated than she was at being caught. As I've said, you could almost feel bad for her. Well, almost. It may sound as if the general manager in this case was more naive than Lisa, but in truth, we can't operate a business under the assumption that every mistake is a theft. Lisa was in fact a nice person and probably a hard worker. It's easy to assume that nice equals honest. And many people suffer from what psychologists call the choice supportive bias. It's a cognitive bias where once you've chosen something, you tend to only see the positives in that choice regardless of the problems that are discovered. In this case, Lisa was one of Barb's hires, someone she had tried to help. So it's not surprising that up until the moment of actual confession, Barb still believed Lisa to be honest. The real problem, however, is that often a well-followed policy gives us a false sense of security, a feeling that since we've done something, all is well. In this case, Barb had done things by the book. She provided counseling, retraining, and corrective action. But a policy is just a guideline. When an employee repeatedly violates it, 
we have to look deeper at the cause of their actions. And a cash loss, like an audit, is more than just about the information. The real value is in what the information means. A good investigation requires we look beyond the facts in order to discover the truth. And while our personal integrity may make the thought of cash theft by an otherwise nice person unbelievable, a pattern is a pattern. And the best investigative course is to remember the old adage, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, well, it's probably a duck. The True Crime Podcast is a production of the LP Innovations Radio Network, written and narrated by executive producer Raymond Esposito, associate producers Heather Beland and Molly Janelle, musical score licensed through Shockwave Sound. The names, locations, and some details have been changed to protect the participants' identities. All suspects are considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. The views and opinions of this broadcast do not necessarily reflect those of LP Innovations, its executive board, management, or staff. LP Innovations and Blue Tracks are registered trademarks. Copyright 2015. All rights reserved.